there was probably a period of a trough of disillusionment. You know, I think when 3.5 hit the scene, uh, many of us assumed everything was possible and AGI was around the corner. It's not a done deal that you just download some AI and then somehow magic occurs. It takes a tremendous amount of work. I'm Matt Marshall, founder and editor-in-chief of VentureBeat. Over the next six minutes, VentureBeat is going to present the three enterprise best practices for using AI by leveraging agentic capabilities. We use the example of Intuit, which like many companies, thought applying AI would be much easier than it was. The result is one you'll want to stick around for. It started with a classic mistake. In the land rush after ChatGPT was launched, Intuit's CEO demanded a shocking AI launch in record time. They delivered Intuit Assist, a chatbot bolted onto their software. It was supposed to be a game changer. When you take a beautiful, well-designed user interface and you simply plop human chat on the side, it doesn't necessarily make it better. Like now suddenly our customers have to start typing things. And they're like, I didn't show up to QuickBooks to talk to it. I showed up to solve my accounting needs, to solve my payroll needs, my money movement needs. It almost put a cognitive burden on people. Like, what can it do? Can I trust it? And so there's definitely a trough of disillusionment, definitely pivots, definitely customer feedback. The pivot didn't come from a spreadsheet. It came from watching a customer work. We're noticing customers are doing split screen when they're filling an invoice. They'll literally have an email on one screen and or a handwritten note, and they'll have the QuickBooks invoice screen on the other. That was a big aha moment for us, which is like, okay, instead of trying to create something new that requires new pixels, that is doing something new, um, find a surface or job or workflow that is like has manual toil. That single observation sparked a new mission and a declaration from the top. In technology, we like to dip our toe in the pool. What this moment showed us is we have to jump into the pool, which means you're gonna to have to disrupt entire experiences that you built before without AI and just say, I'm gonna eliminate the old way, I'm burning the boats. And it's only gonna be the AI way. And so that's like exciting and scary and weird and aggressive and bold and all those kinds of things. Burning the boats meant reinventing how they worked forge a builder culture, starting with their people. So we, as an organization, created all of these small cross-functional teams that are just focused on doing this and nothing else. We actually had to not do some things in order to do these things, yeah. right? And that's always the hard part. And, and it's just incredible the amount of support that we actually got to say, hey, we're gonna do these, but we're not gonna do all of these other things that we originally thought we were gonna do, right? So that ruthless prioritization and that focus was really, really important. Inside these teams, job descriptions dissolved in what leaders called a smearing of roles. One thing we did very early on you know, with Byron and team is, is to say that everybody talks to the customer. Right? Yeah. And it's, it's not just the job of the research team. The right. research team does the logistics and the setting up and yeah. sourcing, yeah. but everybody talks to the customer. And, and it's through talking to the customer that we get out of this tech bubble and into the real yeah. world where actual work gets done. Byron came to me with a prototype Beautiful UI, fully built out dashboard, graphs and all this stuff, right? I'm like, oh my God, you're like a front end engineer now, right? <laughs> like, like, like you are the Renaissance man. You got all, you got it all. With the right people in the right place, they dismantled the slow process of a 40 year old company. So instead of a document or a picture being worth a thousand words, a prototype is worth 10,000 words. People yeah. can start already starting to play yeah. with it, right? Yeah. Then immediately the next day, the user researcher team can take it to, to customers and get their reaction and take on, mm. you know, what does this feel like? We'll literally show a working functioning prototype to the customer and ask for their opinion. And they'll actually tell us live what they don't like. And we'll vibe code it on the spot. And like the reaction on their faces is just like, well, this is magic. To build trust, they gave customers a slider of autonomy to control the AI. And to decide what to build, they used the Marie Kondo method. I started talking to the customer about like, hey, what are the moments in your day that actually brings you joy? Oh, it's when I actually get paid, when the money hits our bank mm -hmm. account, right? It's when we signed that contract and I got that gig that I really wanted, right? It's like. When my taxes are finally done and accepted, whew, that's one thing off my back, right? So, so we, we actually really centered the AI agents around these, uh, these moments of joy and magic. And underpinning it all was the technology. Instead of a slow top-down build, they used a strategy called fast follow harvesting. We instituted a fast follow harvesting model for our platform capability. So what that means is the 
the various agentic teams, um, as they were building, they were leveraging as much of the platform as we had. And where platform capabilities were missing, they figured them out. And then there was a team that basically ran right behind them and said, ooh, that's a cool capability. Let's turn that into a platform. Ooh, that's a cool capability. Let's move that into the platform. And then they would kind of stabilize and modernize and, and um, make sure that it's you know scalable, highly reliable, all that kind of stuff. And then they would go to the other agentic teams and say, hey, look, what's a, what's a feature in the platform now? And then those agent teams would adopt it. A key component was an LLM router that provided resilience. Clarence Huang remembers getting a call from Ashok at 9 p.m. at night. He's like, open the eyes down. Are you guys okay? <laughs> <laughs> but because we were on Gen OS, it just auto-switched to the file back to the next LLM and it was okay, right? Um, similarly, uh, uh, I think a month or two months ago, uh, uh, Gemini completely went down, right? Yeah. In, a, uh, in the afternoon, I was actually uh, talking to my buddies at uh, who works at Alphabet. I'm like, are you guys okay? He was on the Gemini team. He's like, oh man, we're all freaked out. <laughs> yeah. Even our internal chat and everything was down. But you know, we, we, we dropped like less than 20 requests um, mm. because we were um, on Gen OS and the LLM gateway. So did this new playbook of people, process, and platform actually work? The results were tangible. Small businesses using the new payments agent got paid on average five days faster and saved up to 12 hours a month. Engagement soared into the millions. We're seeing strong traction since the launch last month with customer engagement in the millions and repeat usage rates significantly above our expectation. For enterprise leaders, Intuit's story offers a clear roadmap. The initial stumbles aren't just common, they may be necessary. The biggest lesson, start with the work your customers actually do, not the technology you want to deploy.